Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grade 8 Natural Science, Lesson 3. We're on week 3. Our lesson would be 45 minutes. Um, my name is Arifa Hafiji, and I will be continuing from where we left off yesterday. Um, if you have any questions, you can uh, write it on the chat, and my host would uh, send it to me, and I'd be able to answer your questions if you need any help. So today we're going to be discussing expansion and contraction of matter and materials. So I'm going to show you the different matter, um, a different materials that we, you can use for expansion and contraction. And then we're going to discuss pressure. I did introduce pressure to you yesterday. Um, and we'll continue with uh, it today. So a quick recap of what we did yesterday. When a substance absorbs or loses energy, the movement of the particles is affected, which causes its volume to change. So the important thing you, uh, you need to know here is when a substance loses heat energy, sorry, when a substance absorbs or loses heat energy, then the movement of the particles is affected. And when the movement of this particles is affected, it basically causes the volume to change. So we said solids, liquids, and gases, they all expand when heated and due to the increased movement, movement of their particles. So we have the, um, the solid, the liquid, and the gas. It expands when it's heated, and it, it, it expands because the particles have, uh, the movement between the particles have increased. So solids, liquids, and gases contract when it is cooled. So we say expand when it is heated and contract when it is cooled. And it contracts due to a decreased movement in particles. So I'm showing you the differences because in a test they can ask you what's the difference between expansion and contraction in a solid liquid and gases with regards to particle movements in a test or differentiate between it. So you're going to say, in a solid liquid and gas, um, the movement of the particles increase when it is heated, whereas when it is cooled, the movement of the particles, uh, whereas in contraction, um, when the particles are cooled, the movement of the particles decreases. Or when the substance is cooled, the movement of the particles decreases. So this basically is actually quite a good quest test question where they ask you to differentiate. Differentiate means to tell the difference between one thing from another. And then we learned that temperature cha uh, changes affect the volume of the gases and the volume of the solids the least. So the temperature changes affect the volume of the gases the most, and temperature changes the volume of the gases, uh, the volume of the solids the least. So then there are many practical and safety considerations associated with expansion and contraction of matter due to temperature changes. And the practical and safety considerations that we discussed yesterday is to use the right materials um, to allow something to expand or contract. Now, if you don't use the right materials, it's going to crack. Or if you're going to put um, uh, different materials, mix different materials together, then it's going to cause um, particles, like different densities together, it's going to cause particles to um, uh, crack or uh, not particle substances to crack. So when a material is heated, the particles move further apart. And when the materials are cooled, the particles move closer again. So 
I'm just going to uh, uh, say that again. It said when the materials is heated, the particles move further apart. And then when the materials cools down, then we say that the particles move closer again. So heating and cool cooling causes the volume of the materials to change. So we said heating and cooling, it causes the volume. The volume is how much or how little of the materials to change. So in this activity, we're going to just compare the expansion of different solid materials. So now let's say we had the material brass, we had iron, we had steel, we had platinum alloy, we had concrete, we had ordinary glass, and then we had oven proof glass. And now let's say for every 100 meter length of the, this material that I listed here, the temperature was increased by 10 degrees Celsius. So when the temperature was increased by 10 degrees for Celsius for brass, it was 19 millimeters. Then for iron, it's 12 millimeters. For steel, it's 11 millimeters. So platinum alloy is 10 millimeters. So concrete is 11. Ordinary glass is 11. And oven proof glass is 3,5. Uh, now, um, before I... Um, uh, explain, I want you to look at this. So we have steel. So steel is 11 millimeters. Concrete is 11 millimeters. And well, glass is also 11 millimeters, but we won't want to use glass because glass will crack if we have to mix it with any of the other materials we have here for expansion. Um, um, uh, Okay, so which materials expand the most between upon heating? So if we look at our diagram here, now I wrote the answer brass, but if we look at our diagram and we see the highest amount that has been expanded is 19 millimeters, so your answer would be brass. And then they say which material expands the least? So we look at our table here at the bottom. So it's 3,5 millimeters, so it would be oven-proof glass. And then which solids would be the best material to reinforce concrete? So when we talk about reinforce, we mean that when we take another substance to make one substance stronger. So we say which solid would be the best material to reinforce concrete? So what we're going to basically do is we're going to see which two has the same measurement. So steel here is 11 and concrete here is 11 millimeters. But glass is also 11 millimeters, but then we can't mix glass with concrete, right? And so we say, because we want to say the best material to reinforce concrete. So reinforcing materials, should expand as much as concrete. So basically, we want to put some two materials together that would expand the same amount. So we can see here that um, steel and concrete has the same measurement of um, uh, expansion rate, and it won't cause any damage to the concrete. So we use steel as a reinforcing agent to expand and it expands the same amount because it expands the same amount of concrete. So basically, we use we use steel to um, reinforce concrete to make it uh, stronger. Like for example, you would have noticed if uh, if you were driving past or if your parents had been building. So basically, when they pour to lay a good foundation, what they do is that they put the the concrete and then they put steel as well and then they put concrete and they use the steel to make um, building stronger especially when you want to go double story and triple story you have to have the steel to make um, the building stronger and another word is to reinforce the structure of the building so the steel makes it stronger and then in terms of expansion and contraction 
because they have the same rate of increasing and decreasing uh, temperatures, then we use um, the ones that are similar. So a man, let's look at another scenario. A man builds a house with large windows set in a beautiful uh, frame made of grass. And the house is in a region where it gets very hot during summer. Now imagine that the owner of the house has a problem. The windows of the house look really beautiful and shiny and has shiny brass frames. But what happens that in summer it keeps on falling off? So now scientists would want to explore what would be the reason for it, for it to keep on falling off? How would you explain this? And what advice would you give the owner of the house? Should he want to replace the frame for it to prevent it from falling? So then we're going to look at, uh, uh, then you can ask yourself, what material do you suggest? And what solutions would you suggest to uh, overcome this problem? So then we're going to look at our table here again. And we have grass, we have iron, we have steel, platinum alloy, concrete, ordinary glass, and oven proof glass. So now we want to um, use um, uh, a material that's going to prevent the glass from falling off. So we, again, we look at the unit of expansion between the, that has the same unit of expansion. So we can't use concrete with glass, so we have to use a, a metal which would be steel. So steel, steel here is 11 millimeters and the ordinary glass here is 11 millimeters. So we're going to use this one. So let me explain the reason for that. So we see the brass expands much more than the ordinary um, glass. And when the weather is really hot, the brass expands so much that the window does not fit, fit properly or it will fall off or it will crack or it will break. So you would give the owner the following. You should replace the brass frames with the steel frames because the steel expands the same amount of glass. So we said steel expands by the same amount of glass. So now because the steel expands the same amount of glass, the glass would stay in its place. That means that it won't fall off or it won't crack or it won't break because they complement each other. So they, the steel is a good reinforcing agent for the glass. Then the other thing that they can do is to replace the, small, the large windows with smaller windows. So yesterday I told you that smaller items expand less because it has less matter that can expand. So another solution for them is to replace the large windows with the smaller windows. And the reason for this is because the smaller items expand less because there is less matter in it to expand. Now, in addition to the type of materials, the amount of expansion depends on how much material there is. Okay, so basically what you need to know is the amount something expands of how much it would expand basically depends on how much of material there is. Like in smaller substances, they expand less. So larger, sub, larger substances would expand more. So this is why expansion is difficult to see in small items in like cooking pots. Now, I uh, like, for example, in a key, will a key still put in a lock when it is a very hot day? You can ask yourself that because of expansion and contraction. So the answer would be yes, it would fit into the lock because the smaller items expand less. So you don't really notice it in small items, expansion and contraction. But then I have another question for you. Um, let's say you look at the following experiment that I have over here. Now, the following diagram shows a metal ball and a ring, ring apparatus. So if we look at this metal ball here, 
and if we look at the milling apparatus here, the ring and the ball are both made of brass. Okay. And at room temperature, the ball will fit right through this ring over here. Okay. Now, do you think that the ball will fit through the ring when the ball has been heated? So now, if we had to apply heat to this ball here, do you think that it would fit through this ring? So the ball does not fit through the ring when the ball is, um, is heated. Now, you can ask yourself why, because in the previous slide I told you small articles, small part items do not expand so much. So now this is like a, a problem because I told you something differently. So now let's discuss it. Now you can ask how the metal ball will expand. Now in metal, such as iron, the forces between the atoms are stronger. Now because the forces are stronger, it is more difficult for the atoms to move around. Okay, so now in brass, this is where the difference is. In brass, the forces between the atoms are a little weaker. And because they are a little weaker, because that's one of the properties of brass, they free to move about. And this is why the ball expands when it is in heat, it is heated. So metals, the atoms are stronger, so the atoms uh, are difficult to move around. But in, a, in brass, the metals are a little weaker, the forces between the atoms are a little weaker, and this means that um, the ball, uh, uh, a brass ball can expand. So do you think that the brass ball will have more mass when it has expanded? And let's explain the answer. The answer would be no. The brass ball cannot have a greater mass. And because it has not gained any mass. So the brass ball cannot have a, a greater mass because it has not gained anything. The only thing that has changed is um, the particles inside the uh, brass, which is the atoms, which allowed it to expand. And then you need to know that um, matter cannot be created nor destroyed. So matter cannot be created nor destroyed. It just um, uh, either expands slightly or doesn't uh, contract. Now, what will happen if the brass ball, when the temperature drops back to the room temperature, will it be larger will it be that, uh, then or smaller than the same size as it was before? So the answer for this is the ball will contract to the same size as before because, and the reason for this is because it has not gained or lost any atoms. So when it contracts, it goes back to its original state. So brass can only expand when it's heated, but when it contracts, it goes back to its original state. So like in exams or in your test, they can ask you this question here, which I wrote here. What will happen when a brass ball, when the temperature drops to room temperature, would it become larger or smaller, or will it retain its size? Retain its size means that will it be the, the same size as before? And then they'll ask you to explain your answer. So that could be a two mark question. So your one mark would be, you would say that when the ball contracts, it would be the same size as before. And then the second mark would be, and the reason for this is because it has not gained or lost any mass. Okay, and you can further give an explanation by saying that matter cannot be created or destroyed. Okay, so now we're going to move on to gas pressure. I'm going to introduce gas pressure to you. And um, this is because I did li a little bit of this yesterday. So I'm going to start off with what I did yesterday. And then we're going to move on to 
explaining it to you. So you're going to complete it by filling in. Um, I put the answers for you here already. Okay, so let's say you have this gas cylinder here. And these are all the particles that are moving in. So now, basically, you can see this part here, this white part on your left, before the um, gas has been moved in. So let's say that this white part is like, you know, you take a syringe. A syringe is like when a doctor gives you an injection. And then the one part is where he injects it into the bottle and then he pulls the, that, that uh, um, well, basically this thing here uh, um, backwards to fill in the liquid. But now we're not going to look at it as an in, um, liquid being inside. We're going to look at it as being gas inside. So when you pull back that part to put more of uh, this thing, you're increasing the volume. So when you push it more, closer towards the end, you decreasing the volume. So this means that the gas container is compressed. So you are compressing the volume. So now let's give an explanation of this, this fast gas particles while you are compressing it. The volume of the gas particles becomes smaller. So the volume is now reduced, so it becomes smaller. And the spaces between the gas particles are less. Now, if this part here was a lot more, more if it moved more backwards, then obviously the same amount of atoms and particles would be inside, but you'd have a greater space. And then all these particles will spread out. So can you see now by moving this part here more in and you're compressing the gas, then the spaces become smaller. Now the gas particles hit the container walls more. Now because you are reducing the space that, or you're compressing the space, you say that these particles, they are hitting the walls more. Okay, and it's hitting it more frequently. So the gas pressure basically increases. Now because these particles have less space, it's moving around more randomly. And because it's moving around more randomly, we say that the gas pressure has increased because there's a, a lot of movement. So there's a lot of um, um, energy between it. Like for example, if you had to stand very, very close to each other, and if you had to start jumping, I, I, I told you about this scenario earlier on. Now, if you were all standing close together and you were all started jumping, there's lots of pressure around you because you're all moving together, jumping um, uh, close together. Do you understand? So it's the same, the, the pressure around you and also your heat starts increasing because you're all jumping. So your gas pressure increases. So you can ask yourself the question, what is gas pressure? So if we look at this cube here, now in the cube you have all these particles inside and they're going in all different directions. Can you see? So now these are the particles that are moving around in this cube and it's gas and it's moving around randomly it's in no specific order. So we learned that the gases contain millions of fast moving particles. And the picture on the right represents gas particles inside a container. So if we look over here at the millions of the fast moving particles, you could see it in this picture. Now, what's important for you to know is that gas particles in constant motion inside the container, they collide with each other and they are inside the container. So you need to know that they collide with each other. And they are, when gas particles are in constant motion, they collide with each other. So you can see I wrote two sentences. And in these two sentences, I'll show you how to summarize. You take what's the most important. And what's the most important from these two long sentences to make your learning easy? As you say, gas particles in constant motion 
collide with each other. And that's the most important thing that you need to know in these two sentences. So you, when you learn, you don't have to learn every single thing. You just highlight the key things and then you learn the key points and then you can put it in your own sentence when you're going to explain for in your exams. So as the particles was around, they bump and they bounce off each other. So now as these particles are jumping around, they basically going to bump and jump into, into each other. Like how if you can see me drawing on the cube over here. So these two particles will bump into each other. That one would be would bump into each other. In, so the forces of the particles bump against the sides of the container. So even though they're bumping into each other, they also bump along the sides of the container. Okay, so they like bounce, they bump around and they bounce around. And this is when you say that it, it, um, it, it is gas pressure. The pressure has increased as it is um, bump, it is mo moving around. Okay, so the number of the bumps and collisions will depend on the number of gas particles inside the container. So however many times they bump around and collide basically depends on how many gas particles are inside the container. So if this container had less gas particles, then we would say that there's a less chance of them to bump around. But now if you have lots of particles in this container, then there's a greater chance of bumping around. So you can also say that if in this cube, if we increase the volume of this cube, then the gas particles are going to spread out and then there's a less chance of it bumping around. So the gas pressure won't be so great. But when we decrease the volume, then the gas, gas pressure um, is much more, it increases. Um, and then we say more particles inside the container means more collisions, which means that it has a higher pressure. So we have, I'm going to uh, underline it for you. So the, the more particles contained inside means more collisions. So more particles, more collisions. So more particles, more collisions. And more collisions basically mean higher pressure. So what you need to learn here is more particles, more collisions, more collisions, higher pressure. So I'll circle it for you one more time. So we say more particles inside a container, more collisions. And then when we say more collisions, inside the container as well means a higher pressure. Okay, so that's the most important things you need to know. So a gas pressure exerts, a gas exerts a pressure because of the collision of particles with each other against the container. So I'm summarizing what I, I taught you earlier on. So gas exerts a pressure because of the collisions of particles which each other and against the sides of the container. And now pumping more gas into a container increases the number of gas particles in the container. So pumping more gas in, into a container basically increases the number of gas particles. So I'm going to underline it for you. Pumping more gas into a container. Oh, it increases the number of gas particles. Okay. And the increased number of collisions, therefore, an increase in pressure, which is what I showed you earlier on. So increased number of collisions means increase in pressure. So now you also need to know that 
heating also increases pressure by giving the particles more energy. So we say also heating increases pressure, giving it more energy. So the one thing we learned first was that when we reduce the volume, it increases the pressure. Now we're learning that heating also increases the pressure, giving the particles more energy, and this makes them move faster. And now because this makes them move faster, they collide with a greater force. And because they're all next to each other, there's a greater chance of them to collide with each other. Okay. So now we're going to, I'm going to explain to you how gas pressure can be measured. But before I do that, I just want to give you some information about how uh, temperature increases and decreases in, in, with, with wind. Okay, so we say wind basically is moving air, right? And the movement of the air is caused by difference in pressure between the Earth's atmosphere, at pressure, atmosphere and another. So when the wind blows, it, um, it is the atmosphere equaling out. So uneven pressures basically is moving air from high pressure to low pressure. So basically, wind is caused when and pressure is high in one area, you know, like how we said a high concentration, when gases are concentrated high uh, in, in, in one area, and then in, a, in another area there was less concentration, so that low pressure area, so the gas moves from a high pressure to a low pressure, that's the air particles inside, and this causes wind. Okay, so basically wind is caused when air moves from a high pressure to a low pressure. So we say moving air moves from, wind is caused when you move from a high pressure to a low pressure. So now let's see how gas can be measured. So we, I'm going to use the uh, tire pressure gauge exp um, to explain this to you because you're all familiar with, because when you, your parents go to fill up petrol, or if you you see taxis filling up petrol, uh, sorry, um, when they fill petrol, they also measure the uh, pressure in their tires because you need a certain quant certain amount of pressure in the tires so you can drive safely, and um, and the tires need to have that amount of pressure for it to for the car to move smoothly. So the tire pressure gauge is designed to measure the air pressure inside a tire. So you, your parents should actually be testing their pressure in their tires basically every two weeks to check that it has the amount of correct air pressure inside it. And then you use the tire, the pressure gauge to calculate the amount of pressure in it. So I'm going to show, tell you, explain to you how this works. Now the round end of the gauge should be pressed against the air valve of the tire. So this basically round end is pressed against the air valve of the tire. And this opens the valve and it lets some of the air from the tire to escape into this gauge. So when you put this into the tire, so the pressure basically gets, um, uh, goes into the cylinder here and you, it cal will calculate how much pressure it is. And then the air particles bump against the disc inside the gauge. So the air particles basically bump into around this gauge here. And it, the force generated by the gas molecules collisions pushes out on the bar at the back of the gauge. So now the force between these collisions basically pushes out at the back over here and it will give it a reading. Okay, so then this is how the, um, the, this particular pressure gauge, the pressure inside of the tire is indicated by how far back the bar is pushed. And then 
when you can see how far back it is pushed, it will give you a reading and it will tell you how much pressure is inside the tire. So, like in most cars, uh, the pressure is supposed to be 2.2. So, if it is less, then what happens is the petrol attendees, they uh, pump in more pressure into the tires. And then if it is, well, it's never more, but so if it's less, then they pump in more pressure so you can have a smoother, safer uh, ride in the car. So as you grow older, it's very important for you when you start, you when you when you grow up and become employed and eventually buy a car, you must test the pressure of your car every two weeks. And then by testing the pressure and having the correct amount of pressure, this increases your tire life in uh, of your tire in your vehicle. Okay. So how does heating or cooling a gas change its pressure? So we want to know how does expansion and contraction basically change pressure? So it's how heating and cooling change gas pressure. So if the gas is heated, the particles will move faster as they gain more energy. So we say when you heat something, the particles move faster because they gain more energy. And that means that they will collide inside of the container. And then more often it will have more force and this causes a pressure to increase. So if the gas is cooled, the particles will move slowly because they have less energy and the gas pressure will decrease because the particles will bounce against uh, the inside of the container less frequently. So if we look at the picture, um, I didn't do it as a table, I just did it as pictures for you. So if it is um, cooled and the gas particles are cooled, so there's a lot of space in between the particles, so you have fewer and less collisions between the gas particles. But when you heat it and it becomes more hot, then the gas, there's more uh, less space between the particles, so that means that there is more and more energetic collision. So it can collide with each other more, and this basically increases the pressure. Um, we, I want to explain how gas change, how by changing the volume of gas pressure. Um, how changing the volume basically affects gas pressure. So when a gas is squeezed into a small container, and I did it in the first, ex uh, first explanation when I first started, the particles have less space to move. Okay, so when we, if you look at the diagram over here, there's less space to move. And if you, um, if you notice that when people are squashed into small spaces, they basically bump into each other because they cramped. And in the same way, when the gas particles are squashed into a small space, they collide with each other. And that's what we see in this container too, where it's written volume two, because there is less space, so it's more collisions means increased pressure. So the most important thing you need to know is more collisions means increased pressure. So we have learned that a gas will expand to fill all the available space. So when, so what will happen if we take a certain amount of gas out of one container and put it into another container that's twice as large or bigger than it? So we'll have the same number of gas particles. So you see the number of the gas particles here hasn't changed, but they are inside, the, only the volume has changed. So there's twice as much as space between the molecules and then in the smaller uh, container. So that means that in the volume one in this big container, well, same size, but in this volume first container, it is less pressure. So um, what I want to do is, I, there's a chart here and well, I will actually copy this chart and I will load it up as homework for you. It basically gives you a summary of the particle models of matter. 
that we've discussed throughout this week and um, last week as well, because this is basically the end of the section, and we'd be moving on to reactions uh, tomorrow. So you can take a screenshot of this, and then if you look at it quickly, you can ask me some questions uh, with regards to this. It's basically learning through mind map. So here we say particles depends on materials and the density um, depends on the volume. And we, it's basically a mind map of what you can hear and how it is arranged. And then there's a few missing spaces here. So if you can take your camera and take a picture of it, then you can fill in the missing spaces, but you need to study it. So I'm going to copy this and paste it on a worksheet, and then I'll put it on one of the links that we have for you. So does anybody want to ask me a question before I summarize? I'll leave this on for about 30 seconds if you need to get your camera to take a picture of it. Or you can alternatively download it as well, uh, the YouTube video, and you can have and you can look at it. But I'll still leave it on for for 30 seconds. Okay, so I see there is a question. Um, I'm just going to look at it. Okay, so in the earlier experiment where we said that we had the brass ring um, and that uh, small uh, uh, um, ring the bar the brass ball and the ring and then we asked if the brass um why doesn't the ring also expand too so remember we said that we only heated the ball we didn't heat the ring so because we only heated the ball then that expanded and not the ring because we did not heat the ring okay Okay, so another learner said that they did do the experiment and the ball went through the ring. So um, I think it's because you needed to heat it a lot more. That means that you had to heat it with a, a lot of heat. Um, this was an experiment that was done in the natural science textbook on the Department of Education. So the amount of heat that they probably used was significantly higher, which causes it to expand and it didn't go into the ring. So I think it's the amount of pressure that you, the amount of heat that you're going to use that uh, causes the glass to expand. So in summary, we said that the particles of matter are constantly moving. In solids, these movements are limited to vibrations, but in liquids and gases, the particles have more freedom. So most materials will expand when they are heated and contracted when they are cooled. This is because heating makes the particles move further apart and cooling makes them move closer together. So when we want to know how much of gas we have, we, say we can measure its pressure. So if you want to measure how much of gas something is, we're basically measuring the pressure. Now, when we want to measure how, how much of water we have, we measure volume. So can you see the difference in measurement? So gas is we measure pressure. Um, um, and then for volume, for liquid, we measure it with volume. So the pressure of a gas is caused by the particles of the gas colliding with the inside of the container and each other. 
and the more gas particles inside the container will mean more collisions against and therefore more pressure. So is there any more questions that anybody has? You can let me know. So the information that I derived from this lesson was from Stiovela, um, and that's the website address. Uh, you, the Department of Education also uses this book as their uh, workbook. So my email address is a-H-A-F-F-E-A -F -F -E at gmail.com. You're welcome to ask me questions if you need to more, know more information. And tomorrow we'll be doing chemical reactions. So I'm going to discuss what is a chemical reaction, what happens to atoms and the bonds between them during a chemical reaction, how we can identify a reactant and the product, and um, I'll give examples of chemical reactions in indigenous substances if we have time to do that. Um, I Going through slowly, going through the lesson slowly would help you consolidate the information better. So I will put up what I think will help you understand um, going at a pace that makes it easier for you to remember all the information instead of giving you too much of information and then you get a bit stuck. So here's my email. I have one more question coming up. So they asked if the pressure will explode if there's too much of pressure inside. Yes. Depending on what is holding the, um, uh, the material that is holding it inside. But if you put a lot of pressure in something, like for example, if you, the, the tire example that I used, if you put a lot of pressure into your car tire, more than it's supposed to be, then the tire is going to burst. It's going to explode. So this is basically, and if you see, if, have you ever watched the movie, the Titanic and stuff? Now, you know, before the ship, uh, was going to sink and you and if you can picture and you remember the people in at downstairs at the bottom where where the controls of the um, uh, ship was um, you saw all that steam coming out so that steam coming out was basically the pressure that was inside the metal that was holding um, it and because it was there was too much of pressure in it it caused it to crack um, and that's why you had the, that exploding. Okay, so if there are no more questions, then thank you so much for attending. I wish to see you and hope to see you tomorrow. If you need any information, please feel free to contact me. And I had a lovely time tutoring you, and I hope you've gained from this experience. So see you tomorrow, same time, and happy studying. Goodbye.